This year, Australia has witnessed a series of terrifying crimes which gained widespread media attention. Most shocking, perhaps, was the killing spree of Joel Couchy at a shopping mall in Sydney's Bondi Junction on the 13th of April. Couchy stabbed six people to death, five of them women, before he was fatally shot by a female police officer, Amy Scott, who has been commended for her bravery. Couchy was a deeply disturbed individual who apparently suffered from schizophrenia and had not been taking his drugs that should have kept his symptoms under control. The public horror and concern over these events have sparked much discussion. Some have suggested that Australia is experiencing a spate of femicides, killings of women, especially by present or former romantic partners. Activists have demanded legislative and institutional reforms to be underpinned by a formal declaration of a national emergency. Here in Australia, however, the term national emergency has a specific legal meaning related to natural disasters. So Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has preferred to speak of a national crisis. Every violent death is one too many, but are we really in the throes of a crisis? Let's check some facts and figures. In fact, Australia's homicide rate has been declining. There are half as many murders per year as there were just 30 years ago. There was a rise in the number of murders from 2021 to 2022, but we should put this in perspective. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, there were 370 instances of homicide and related offences in 2021. This figure includes 193 murders, plus all recorded cases of attempted murder and manslaughter. The equivalent statistics for 2022 show 377 crimes in this category, but they do not specify how many of these were murders. The Bureau's 2023 figures show a further increase to 409 incidents. Once again, these figures do not separate out the number of murders. These numbers may appear to indicate a worrying trend, but in fact, the number of these crimes has always varied unpredictably year to year. As it happens, 2021 had the lowest crime rate in this category since 1993. Over the slightly longer time span of 2017 to 2023, the figures were 432, 375, 416, 396, 370, 377, and 409. This looks far more like a plateau than a line that's trending upwards. Another way of tracking homicides over time is to look at the aggregated annual statistics collected by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. The UN records 193 intentional homicides in Australia in 2021, exactly matching the number of murders reported by the ABS. Somewhat worryingly, the UN documents 218 intentional homicides in Australia in 2022, a rise of 13 percentage points. But this is once again because the figure for 2021 was exceptionally low and therefore it cannot be used as a fair baseline. A closer look at the UN figures confirms the impression of a plateau over the past few years. According to the UN, the number of intentional homicides in Australia were higher in the past, even though Australia's population was smaller than its current 26 million. For example, there were 374 intentional homicides in 1990, 385 in 1999, and 366 in 2002. Since then, there has been a clear downward trend. When expressed as a rate per 100,000 people, this trend is even clearer. The rate of intentional homicides per 100,000 people, henceforth the homicide rate, was 2.19 in 1990, 2.05 in 1999. It had fallen to 0 0.85 in 2017 and has largely plateaued since. 0 0.86, 0 0.74, and 0 0.83 in the years 2020 to 2022. Recent homicide rates in Australia are less than half of those of the 1990s. Ideally, of course, the rate should be zero, but the figures do not suggest the presence of any social, cultural, or economic factor that has been pushing the rate upwards. Instead, we might wonder what forces have caused the homicide rate to decline. Female homicide rates have always been much lower than male ones, typically around half as many women as men are murdered, though this figure also varies unpredictably. According to the UN data, the highest female homicide rate in Australia was 1.65 in 1991, at a time when the equivalent male figure was 2.29. 
In 2022, the female homicide rate was less than half that of the male rate, 0.51 versus 1.18. In fact, 2021's exceptionally low homicide rate was mainly because of an exceptionally low female homicide rate that year, 0.38 compared to a male rate of 1.10. The number of murders of women and girls by intimate partners and family members has also been trending downward, according to the UN statistics. From 2015 to 2022, these rates were 0.52, 0.43, 0.34, 0.43, 0.38, 0.40, 0.25 in 2021, and 0.27. So how does Australia's homicide rate compare to that of other countries? The most recent UN homicide rates for our closest neighbour, New Zealand, were 1.03 in 2020 and 1.11 in 2021, slightly higher than Australia's 0.86 and 0.74 in those years, and 0.83 in 2022. Australia's annual homicide rates are, in fact, broadly like those of other major countries of Western Europe. Australia's rate is about the same as Germany's, lower than those of France and the UK, but a little bit higher than Italy's. The latter country has an impressively low rate of 0.55 in 2022. Switzerland's homicide rate was lower still at 0.48 in 2022. Compared to the Nordic countries, which are often portrayed as social utopias, Australia is once again in the middle of the pack. In 2022, our homicide rate was a little bit lower than Denmark's 0.99, Sweden's 1.10 and Finland's 1.25, but higher than Norway's 0.55. Countries with tiny populations, such as Iceland, have homicide rates that fluctuate wildly from year to year and can't easily be compared to those of more populous countries. Overall then, Australia's homicide rate broadly matches those of the sophisticated European countries with which we like to compare ourselves. Interestingly, many countries in Eastern Europe also have rates in the same ballpark as their Western European counterparts, although, as we'll see, Russia is an outlier. In Anglophone North America, the outcome is strikingly different. Canada's homicide rate is more than double Australia's, 2.27 in 2022, but much lower than that of the United States, 6.38 in the same year. You're about seven times more likely to be murdered in the US than in Australia, even though America's recent figures are a considerable improvement on those of the 1990s. In 1990, the rate was 9.45. At 6.80, Russia's homicide rate in 2021, the most recent year for which figures are available, was very similar to that of the US. But even the US is a safe country compared to many parts of the world. In 2022, the rate was 20.61 for Brazil, 26.11 for Mexico, 45.53 for South Africa and a remarkable 53.34 for Jamaica. Before Australians become too complacent, however, we should consider how low homicide rates are in East Asia. In 2022, Japan had a homicide rate of 0.23, while Singapore's was an impressive 0.12. The UN does not provide figures for South Korea, but it's generally agreed that, as historian Philip Dwyer puts it, countries like China, Japan, Korea, and Singapore have some of the lowest homicide rates in the world. In his 2022 book, Violence, A Very Short Introduction, Dwyer ascribes this to such factors as economic growth without accompanying concentrations of poverty and the strong social stigma attached to arrest for crime. Generally speaking, countries in Europe and the Antipodes are economically prosperous and have effective legal systems. Most of these countries are also politically stable and their social inequalities are largely ameliorated by strong socioeconomic safety nets. There's also far less access to firearms in most of these countries than in the US, although Switzerland is an exception. Still, the use of firearms in Switzerland is tightly regulated. As Dwyer points out, Switzerland's gun ownership is integrated into its model of national defense, whereas many Americans regard their guns as a potential protection against the state. However, as Dwyer also notes, the US homicide rate remains high even if we set aside deaths involving guns. Numerous factors could explain this, including social inequality and the presence of large, socially alienated groups. But comparing countries like Japan and Singapore with the US suggests that part of the story must be cultural differences, both between and within societies. East Asian societies are sometimes described as cultures of face. Such cultures tend to be cooperative, collectivist, and hierarchical. By contrast, the United States contains large regions, in particular the American South, which are considered honor cultures. 
In such cultures, it is considered cowardly not to avenge slights to one's reputation. This is reflected in significantly higher homicide rates in the South, which contribute to the high homicide rates in the US as a whole when compared to other Western liberal democracies. Australia is made up of people from many socioeconomic, national, ethnic, religious, cultural and subcultural backgrounds, but when viewed as a whole, Australia is best understood as having a culture of dignity. In a dignity culture, it's seen as beneath a person to respond violently to mere slights. Dignity cultures also encourage negotiation and tolerance. This might help explain Australia's low homicide rate compared to other countries, but it also suggests that Australia's homicide rates will always be higher than those of Japan and Singapore. The problem is that cultures of face are package deals. They impose a social stigma against violence and criminality, but they are also hierarchical and tend to include both top-down surveillance and the social monitoring of each other. This is a degree of social authoritarianism that is unlikely to be acceptable to most Australians. But there are other societies with dignity cultures, such as Norway, Italy and Switzerland, whose homicide rates are lower than those of Australia, so there must be some things that we are doing wrong. Let's talk about dealing with violent men. Much of the current concern in Australia about homicide is centred on murders committed by men who have already committed violent acts or were known to be likely to be violent. A recent report has examined judges' sentencing comments in cases where women were killed by current or former intimate partners, drawing on a data set of 235 such cases over the period of 2007 to 2016. The perpetrators typically had mental health issues, histories of drug abuse, and track records of unemployment and of previous violence. A significant proportion of them were born outside of Australia. Many had already been flagged by the healthcare or criminal justice systems as a potential danger to themselves or others. This is worrying. However, one obvious problem is that, in our country of 26 million, many men fit such a profile. Many men are alienated, unhappy, unstable, unemployed, depressed or desperate. Many are recent immigrants, and yet most of these men will never go on to kill anybody. Few of us would want to live in a country that finds such individuals guilty of some sort of pre-crime. It's a non-trivial task to work out exactly when and how government agencies should intervene in the lives of particular men on the grounds that they might be on a slippery path, since any such interventions will inevitably involve some degree of coercion. We should undertake any such measures with caution, alert to possible downsides, rather than with an emergency or crisis mentality. As we've seen, Australia's homicide rate, including the rate of murders of women, has plunged since the 1990s. Over the past three decades, the rate of recorded sexual assaults has increased significantly, from 69.1 per 100,000 of the population in 1993 to 136.3 in 2023. However, this increase could be due to the fact that more of the incidents that occur are being reported to the police. The statistics could also be affected by changed legal definitions or social understandings of some of the crimes involved. The ABS statistics released for 2023 illustrate the changed rate since 1993, with a truncated graph that greatly exaggerates the appearance of the increase, further fueling the notion that we are living amid an epidemic of violence against women. Yet we should expect the published figures to increase from year to year due to increased reporting, even if the actual level of crime stays constant. Moreover, we lack a coherent story of how an increase in recorded sexual assaults can be reconciled with a much lower rate of homicidal violence against women over the same period. For all these reasons, the statistics on sexual assault should be approached with care. But even so, the fact that there has been a rise of almost 100% in reported sexual assaults over the past 30 years is a concern. Crisis narratives are dangerous. In the 1960s, Frankfurt School philosopher Herbert Marcuse was willing to justify intolerance and political violence because he lived, as he saw it, in a morally catastrophic political environment in which civil discussion was futile. In his essay, Repressive Tolerance, Marcuse suggests that radical groups should oppose regressive viewpoints by any means necessary. He advocated no longer tolerating the speech and assembly of a wide variety of individuals and movements, not only fascists and white supremacists, but social conservatives and political libertarians. He writes, Such extreme suspension of the right of free speech and free assembly is indeed justified only if the whole society is in danger. I maintain that our society is in such an emergency situation 
in that it has become the normal state of affairs. But once a society's normal state of affairs is viewed as an emergency situation, extreme suspensions of rights can always be justified with no end in sight. There are furthermore, always political zealots who will define the status quo as an emergency and demand revolutionary change. Crisis narratives about crime and violence are especially dangerous because they can prompt highly illiberal responses, especially when suspects are denied the right to the presumption of innocence. In addition, such narratives spread division and fear and have polarizing effects that can, in themselves, lead to greater violence and danger. Without a reality check, emotionally salient but rare events, such as murders, can seem like ever-present threats, requiring an authoritarian or vigilante response. Men can be feared and demonized, though the worst behavior comes from only a small subset of men. If we demonize all men as an inherently violent group, we will make useful, widespread public cooperation on the issue impossible. It is also wrong to send fear-mongering messages to children and adolescents. We shouldn't want boys to grow up feeling somehow tainted and vicariously guilty thanks to the actions of a minority of their sex. Neither should we want girls to grow up anxious and scared in what is a largely safe society. Australia has a reputation as a laid back, friendly place, and it's among the least violent countries in the world. But all countries have problems with violence. Australia is no exception. We have our share of violent subcultures and violent men, and some violent women too. The challenge then is to try to push our rates of violence even lower, but without resorting to hyperbolic rhetoric or pretending that we are in the throes of a crisis. This essay was written by Russell Blackford and published in Quillette in July 2024. It was read by me, Zoe Booth. If you want to read it for yourself, you can head to quillette.com. Thanks for listening. 